Hi, everyone. Uh, apologies for the background noise. I'm, uh, I'm sitting in the airport. Um, Alex is having some difficulties getting logged in. We'll get, uh, get those worked out here shortly. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Tom Champion to go ahead and do his presentation. And hopefully, by the time he's done, we'll have uh, Alex uh, situated. We can continue on. So, Tom, uh, go ahead, and I'm going to go on mute so everybody's not having to listen to this noise. Okay. Yeah. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Tom Champion. I'm the director of our T901 programs here at uh, General Electric, and I'm going to just uh, give you a little bit of the background of the program, the improved turbine engine program that the Army program uh, Army is running, and our T901 engine that was ultimately selected for full-scale development for that program. So with that, uh, just a little bit about General Electric. Well, what? Whoops. Sorry about that. A little bit of a delay here. So. First of all, uh, you know, GE has, is very proud and, and humbled to have been selected by the Army to develop this next generation engine uh, that will power uh, the Army's Blackhawks and Apache enduring fleets well into the future. Uh, it, it's a, obviously a big deal for our company and uh, we are really honored to, to qualify this engine and bring this capability to the warfighters uh, that will really help support the multi-domain operation uh, future of the U.S. Army. Okay, where's my lights? So uh, here at GE, we've got a long history of uh, developing and, and producing and fielding and supporting turboshaft engines for helicopters. Uh, obviously, the T-700 and the CT-7 commercial variant of that engine have been really the foundation of our helicopter engine franchise here at GE for the past 45 years. And you can see all the various applications that that engine family uh, powers today. Uh, if you go back, our, our history in the T-58, T-64, developed in the, the late 50s and 60s to, to power early versions of turbine-powered helicopters. And then more recently, the T-408 is in production today for the CH-53K. Uh, and we've got the T-901 engine, which we're in, in the beginning of our development program with the government to get that into production by 20, early 2025 to go re-engine all the Black Ox and Apaches out there. So, you know, I, I, I had a general manager once upon a time early in my career who talked about how designing and, and qualifying and manufacturing and, and, and supporting turbine engines is one of the hardest things in the world. I would argue that doing that and integrating it all that applies to, to helicopters and then integrating the two is something that's really hard and that's why there's only a handful of companies in the world that, that do it and uh, so it, it's for me it's been really incredibly rewarding to be part of a couple of these programs of developing new platforms and this one is sort of generational So real quick, the Infused Turbine Engine Program, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, it is a U.S. Army program to replace the T-700 in, in their Blackhawks and Apaches. Uh, you know, it's the history of it. If you look at the bottom of the chart here, you know, the science and technology program started back in 2007, and eventually it, it evolved into a program of record in the early uh, 2011, 2012, 2013 timeframe, which ultimately led to a technology maturation risk reduction contract in 2016 that finally led to a, a, a down select of one company, GE, develop the, uh, through the full-scale engineering and manufacturing development program in 2019. The, the program was really driven by the need for better performance. So there were a couple of different things that were going on in that time frame in the early 2010s. Uh, the, the the DOD had launched their operational energy initial capabilities document. And that's really what launched the program was going after the fuel efficiency to reduce the, the fuel and the, and the, the uh, environmental impact of the Blackhawks and Apaches is how the program got launched. But at the same time, there was an operational need that uh, you know the Afghanistan mission challenges of operating at 6K 
95 degrees versus the 4,000 feet, 95 degrees that uh, the Blackhawk and the T700 were really, that was the design point for, the, for the, that platform back in the day. And so they wanted to get more power and uh, get better fuel efficiency. And that, that's what really sort of launched the program uh, in sort of the 2012, 2013 timeframe. Uh, it is a significant opportunity. Obviously, there's a lot of Blackhawks and Apaches in the U.S. Army fleet, so it's you know, about a 6,000 engine opportunity there. And then after uh, the EMD selection, the Army also designated the T-901 to be the, the power plant for the future attack reconnaissance aircraft. And so that uh, is you know, roughly about 500 aircraft that the Army will be looking to uh, field with the FARA program. And uh, Probably a lot of you that are on the phone are familiar with that program. Obviously, the, the Sikorsky Raider X and the uh, L360 Invictus are in a competition today with their competitive prototypes to fly those aircraft next year uh, with the T901 engine in it. So, as I alluded to earlier, this has been a, a long program with the Science and Technology program that advanced, advanced Affordable Turbine Engine, which was launched in 2007, and really. You know, this, this whole program development, the Improved Turbine Engine Program, you can see the parallels of what the Army did there with what's going on in future vertical lift, both with the FLORA and the FARA program, where it was led by sort of a science and technology program, and then uh, that led into a program of a record. And I got to say, the Army really did a, a great job of leveraging competition to get value for the warfighter and for the taxpayer. And so the Advanced Turbine Engine Company, which is a 50-50 joint venture of Honeywell and Pratt and Whitney, they were also awarded a, a science and technology program for the Advanced Affordable Turbine Engine. They were also awarded a tech maturation risk reduction contract. And ultimately, it was a competition between GE and, and the Advanced Turbine Engine Company for the final down select to EMD. And uh, it, it was a significant competition and those who are involved in FLORA and FARA can appreciate uh, what that is like and, and how it really brings out the best in both competitors and brings value to the warfighter and the capabilities that uh, the companies are able to develop and the taxpayers by having that, that competition uh, as we work through that. So uh, having said that, a little bit more on the Advanced Affordable Turbine Engine Science and Technology Program. We were awarded a contract in 2007. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, uh, the Army awarded a second award for that program to the uh, ATEC, the Advanced Turbine Engine Company, which is that 50 50 joint venture. The science and technology had you know, pretty aggressive goals of improving the specific fuel consumption of the engine by 25% and improving the power to weight by 65% and getting the operating support costs down by 35% when compared to the T700 that is out there today. And, and frankly, you know, I, I'm biased. It is the best in industry from a uh, helicopter engine in the world today, the T700. So those were lofty goals. We went through a significant uh, science and technology program we, where we ran component tests as well as, you know, two full engine builds uh, to demonstrate our progress towards meeting those goals. Uh, and all the while, as we were going through that program, you know, the joint venture was doing the same thing, and, and the program slowly morphed into a, a real program of record towards the latter part of that program, and we were getting prepared for uh, a real competition for a program of record. Hey, Tom, can I interrupt that quick? Sure. Um, Sadat joined, so I wanted to let him take, take a moment to introduce himself. And I'm sorry it's in, in the middle of your presentation, but I'm going to have to go here in a second. So I wanted to give him that opportunity. Okay. Sadat, you want me to keep going or do you want to? To that, would you like to make a, introduce yourself? There you go. Yeah, yeah, you can keep going, John. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. So uh, the TMRR competition. So the the government, uh, you know, they went through their milestone A, uh, kind of in the 
2014 to 2015 timeframe, they were working through their own milestone A process that allowed them to then go out and, and award the tech maturation risk reduction contract. Uh, they, they had plans to uh, award up to two awards. And that, in fact, that's what they ended up doing. They, they had interest from you know, maybe at least one third company that was interested in the program. Ultimately, they awarded two contracts, one to GE and one to the 5050 uh, Advanced Turbine Engine Company joint venture. Um, if there was a significant technical volume that was part of that TMRR, you know, 1500 page technical volume. Uh, and uh, ultimately, you know, GE coming out of the S&T program, we, we, when it became clear this was a program of record, we wanted to do some additional risk reduction work and we, we invested in our own additional third engine beyond what was done in the science and technology program. And that really helped us with that 1500 page technical volume because we had a, a, a significant amount of design data that we were able to incorporate into that, uh, that proposal. And uh, off we went in 2016, we got awarded the contract for TMRR, which the main scope of the tech maturation risk reduction program was really to, to take the final uh, milestone A requirements, technical requirements and, and, and program requirements and go through a preliminary design review with the government and then develop a uh, proposal for the EMD program and then wait for the down select and then move on into the full scale development. So that the scope was to do the preliminary design review with the government and submit an EMD contract. So we worked through that. It was a two year program. Uh, during the second half of that program in 2017, the Army was going through their milestone B process so that they could then award a, a final uh, EMD contract. Uh, we went through getting a draft RFP in June of 17, a final RFP in November of that year, and then submitting a, a phased proposal where we kind of proposed the, the uh, cost and schedule. And then after the PDR was completed with the government, we submitted our technical proposal and then the government did their, their full evaluation, went through the down selection process and awarded uh, GE the EMD contract in early February of 2019. So sort of the, the, the parallels, that's sort of like what's going on. I'll, I'd say, uh, you know, floors through that process and they, both, both competitors there have submitted their final proposal and the Army's doing their, their evaluation now. And for the FARA program, I, uh, you're kind of in the competitive prototype phase right now, and my understanding that they're, they're also working on what is that final configuration, getting the proposals in ready for for uh, you know getting the RP ready for proposals so that they can do a down select after flight test next year. So as we went through that process, clearly once you have a draft RP, you want to make sure you understand the criteria and that they align well with the the goals from Army leadership and that you understand uh, what those are and make sure you, you're developing a product that's going to really meet the goals. Um, and then once we got the final RFP, you know, our goal was to win in every evaluation factor. And we did everything we could in our proposal to make sure we, we were putting our best foot forward in each of the evaluation factors. And, and finally, preparing for what happens after the award is announced. And you can see, you know, we, we got awarded in February and shortly thereafter, there was a GAO protest filed by the Advanced Turbine Engine Company. And we went through the full 90 day GAO protest period. And then the, the GAO uh, denied the protest, upheld the award to GE, and then, and then we were able to get back going with the government. So, uh, you know, definitely some parallels here to, to what is going on in the FBL world with Flora and Farah. So from our perspective, some of the lessons learned when you go into one of these source selections, you know, you need the best product, but you also need the best proposal because ultimately the selection board has to deal with what's in the proposal and, and that's what they make their selection on. Uh, you know, you need to have your entire enterprise decide what it's going to take to win and then rally the resources to go do that. Uh, 
you know, the importance of current contract performance is, is pretty important. Uh, if you're already a contractor with the, the U.S. Army, that sets some, you know, previous uh, performance that is, is a factor and you want to make sure you're doing everything on your current contract performance to, to make sure you do well in that category. Um, and then anybody who's dealt with the, with the government knows that, uh, you know, there are many customers within, in this case in the Army, there's many customers and all of them are critical and all have a, have a, a viewpoint and a, a voice at the table. You've got ultimately the war fighters who are going to operate the product. You've got folks in the Pentagon. You've got your contracting command, and, and you've got your subject matter experts that are going to be evaluating the technical piece of it and making sure you understand all of those customers and, and what their key uh, key elements that they're looking for are, and, and making sure you're addressing them is pretty important. And then, obviously, you know it's not over when it's over. The, the, post-election fight, uh, protests is something that I know uh, in our case, the government was always thinking about and, and certainly we were thinking about it as well. So definitely some parallels to, to the future vertical lift. I think the Army uh, felt good about the results they got out of the improved turbine engine program and the way that that program was run and the selection was run and the lead up to it. And so they're leveraging that across the board uh, for future vertical lift. So now we're, you know, 2019, uh, we've been at this for a few years now. Uh, we weren't expecting a, a pandemic to happen uh, a year after we were awarded, but that did happen. Uh, but so here's, you know, we went through the critical design review with the government in the summer of 2020 and had to do that all virtually as we dealt with lockdowns and lack of travel through the pandemic. Uh, that was, you know, we did some early learnings on how to run a virtual meeting like that, and we were pretty successful in getting through, you know, four weeks of uh, four weeks of doing virtual critical design reviews. Uh, we came out of that and went off to go get our hardware for our first engine to test uh, amidst the pandemic. We were able to finally get that engine fired up in March just last month. We have about 100 hours of testing planned. Or, you know, we're currently in that. 100 hours or about roughly a third of the way through the, the test plan uh, and things are going well on on there. Uh, this first engine to test is designed to be an engineering test only to, to kind of ring out the design and find any early learnings and we typically always do find something on this. I would say so far the engine's performing really well, no major surprises and a few things that uh, you know we're learning that we know how to fix and we're going to go fix for the second engine. Um, and then in order to, to actually run the program, we, we had to upgrade some of our test cells here in Lynn to, to meet the, both the program requirements as well as uh, you know, the higher power, et cetera, of the engine. So, so we'll have three cells here in Lynn. We'll, have, uh, we'll be doing altitude testing out in our Cincinnati facility, as well as using some government facilities for some special tests, including down at Pax River and, and uh, up in Canada to do some icing tests. Ultimately, we'll be doing 5,000 hours of factory testing across all those different test cells. 1,500 hours of that testing is to gain a preliminary flight release, which is planned for 2023 next year, that will allow the flight testing to begin on uh, the FAR CP aircraft as well as the Black Hawk Apache. So we're early on. We've got obviously we've got 30 hours of you know 5,000 hours, so it's very early. Uh, we're encouraged with, with the performance of the engine so far. We've got you know, a ton of testing to do over the next couple of years that ultimately will put the Army in the position to be able to, you know, go to Milestone C and, and get into production with this engine in the 2025 timeframe. So that, that was my kind of quick one over on the history of the program and where we're at today. And I think uh, with that, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Carl. 
Yeah, if there's any questions, we can start submitting them in the chat. Or if anybody wants to come off mute, uh, you're welcome to ask for yourself. Uh, yeah, Mike, go ahead and come off mute. You can ask questions. Yeah, Mike, you want Uh, let's see a few questions in the chat. Um, first one is um, Uthman. Uh, is there a problem with Army trying to solve with this engine? Uh, Tom, you're still on mute. There we go. Thank you. I've been muted by the organizer and could not mute myself. I think the question was, you know, is there a problem the Army's trying to solve with this engine? And uh, the there were two. Those were the two things that were on one of my charts. Really, the first was uh, the Blackhawk and Apache when they were fielded back in the late 70s, early 80s, were at a certain gross weight. Over the years, there. There have been different upgrades and mission systems that have been added that have grown the gross weight of the aircraft. And then, uh, then they found themselves, you know, and we, we actually grew the, the power of the T-700 from the original T-700-700 that was first fielded in the late 70s, along with some growth in the aircraft weight. But it kind of came to a head in Afghanistan where they were having to fly very high and hot and, and had all this additional weight on the aircraft and, and, the, and the aircraft and the engine weren't designed to fly at 6K95 at the, at the sizing point, it was 4K95. So that was, that was one motivation was to grow the power of the engine to be able to um, restore the full, full capability of the uh, mission envelope for these heavier aircraft. And then the second one really was to, to gain the uh, fuel efficiency to reduce the, the the logistics burden and the environmental burden of the fuel that's burned with the, uh, the current engine. So there's some benefits operationally for the, from the better fuel efficiency. They can they can fly further, not potentially require a, a forward area refueling point. And uh, obviously there's cost savings from, from not uh, burning as much fuel. So those were the, really the two, the two main factors that the government, the army is looking to solve with the program. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. Um, uh, we have two more questions. Um, what do you consider some of the major technical risk items that you can describe uh, and 
to explain the mitigation experts. Yeah, so you know, one of the one of the fundamental requirements of this program was to grow the power by 50% and, and reduce the specific fuel consumption by 25% while still maintaining the same installation footprint and mount points in the Blackhawk and Apache that, that exist today. So same same envelope, grow the power by 50%, improve the specific fuel consumption by 25%. You, you can't do that without you know some new technologies and how do you how do you get there and and so some of the things uh big drivers that enable us to do that is you know advanced 3d aerodynamics on all of our airflows um, that allows to get better efficiency higher temperature materials that we are able to use at this point compared to when the t700 was introduced that allows us to to get more power out of the fuel we're burning and and, and then uh in order to fit in that same envelope and keep the weight relatively the same as a T700. Uh, you know, there were some other technologies. Some of those technologies, materials that are higher capability at lower densities, like CMCs, uh, additive manufacturing, where we're able to uh, get both performance and weight out of parts that you would traditionally uh, cast, perhaps. Uh, so, so those are some of the key technologies that enable the the higher power, the lower fuel burn. And then from a risk reduction perspective, you know, we demonstrated the component tests, engine tests throughout that science and technology program, as well as uh, uh, to a certain extent during the tech maturation risk reduction program. So we, we have done more component and engine testing as we launch into this EMD program than you know any other program that I'm aware of. And I think that uh, you know my my boss Harry Nahanis, who I think is on the listening in as well, has has experience with. So significant risk reduction to the point where you know most turbine engine programs, you run your FETT and, and the biggest risk is meeting the power and, and, and fuel burn goals. And uh, that's really not an issue for us because we've burned that risk down during the, the previous efforts on this program. All right, thank you, Tom. Uh, next question is, uh, you had a chart showing some target metrics you wanted to achieve over the T700. Can you describe a little more in detail some design features that improve upon the T700? Yeah, I think I think I mostly just answered that. Uh, you know, obviously, the, the, those goals were 50% more power, 25% better fuel burn, uh, and better operating and support costs. Uh, I guess you know one of the things uh, from an ONS cost perspective, you know, this the T901 engine has a full authority digital electronic control, or aka a FADEC, whereas the T700 uh, is not a FADEC powered uh, or controlled engine. And within our FADEC, we actually have uh, a digital twin of the engine that's running in the FADEC. And we have uh, one or two extra sensors on the engine that actually allows us to, uh, to feed that digital twin and actually model exactly how that particular engine on that aircraft is actually performing, which provides us incredible ability to do prognostic health management uh, much better troubleshooting, much better trending of performance, much better tracking of critical uh, critical rotating parts life, because you, instead of having to sort of assume a mission profile, you actually know how the engine was operated and you can understand what the damage is to those rotating parts, life limited parts. So those are, that that's one of the technologies that really allows us to meet the operating and sustainment cost goals. And then, from a fuel burn and power, I mentioned uh, some of the big ones, you know, better materials in the CMCs and, and the 3D aerodynamics and, and additive technologies are, are part of the big ones. Great, I think going off of that, we had a question, um, if you can elaborate more on the advanced technology in the engines, particularly on the CMCs and additive manufacturing. Yeah, so uh, you know the CMCs, we've we've got those 
we've used CMCs in our commercial large bypass, you know, turbo fan engines for the commercial world. And you're able to go to much higher temperatures and the, the density of the CMC material compared to the, the, the metal-based materials they were replacing. It's a third, third the density. So you get a, a weight benefit and you're able to operate at higher temperatures. You're able to operate in the harshest part of the engine, you know, in the in the high pressure turbine coming out of the combustor at very high temperatures and not have to use uh, traditional uh, cooling air that that uh, is basically a parasitic drag on your performance of that you're putting out for the customer there, the power or the fuel burn, and uh, eliminate some of the environmental barrier coatings that we would typically use in that hot section. So that 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 is that piece and then additive really opens up the design space for the engineers. You're not, you're not constrained by subtractive manufacturing limitations and are able to really come up with some unique designs that provide, you know, trifecta where you get better performance, you get lighter weight and, and can make the part, uh, you can combine parts that would be fabricated and, and, and get it Cost, cost reduction as well. So um, yeah, I think this, I think that kind of covers it. I don't know. Is there more to that question? Uh, yeah, no, thank you for your answer. Um, that uh, that about covers all the questions that we had come in so far. Uh, does anybody else have any additional questions? You can put them in the chat or come off mute. Okay, uh, last call for questions. Okay, I think that's uh, all the questions that we have. So thank you, Tom, for your presentation and uh, taking your time to be here with us tonight. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, like I said, we're we're early on in the test phase of the program. It's going to be an exciting couple of years, and, and we are really looking forward to to uh, getting this product fielded to the to our Army warfighters out there and, and bringing the capability uh, that this engine brings to the, to the defense of the country. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, this will conclude the webinar, so have a good night. Thanks.